Hey everyone, Houston Math Prep here for our first video in our Linear Algebra video series. We'll be doing an introduction to systems of linear equations. If you're looking for just a plain algebra video on systems of linear equations, you can check out our other video in the link below this one. You may already be familiar that a linear equation is an equation that contains no operations on the variable except addition or subtraction of constant multiples of those variables, something like our 2x plus 3y equals 5, or our 7x minus 4y equals 9 here. Notice there aren't any exponents, roots, trig functions, logarithms, terms with multiple variables. In our system, you'll notice that we have information about more than one variable or unknown thing. And a system of linear equations simply means that we're considering more than one of this type of equation together at the same time. The idea being that the solution is when all of the listed statements or equations are true. In something like a beginning algebra class, we usually see systems with two or three variables, with our two variable systems often having variables x and y, and our three variable systems commonly using x, y, and z. In linear algebra, when we're looking at these systems, it's possible that we'll encounter problems with many more variables than that. So rather than worrying about what letter to start with as our first variable, or even about running out of letters in the alphabet, if the problem's large, We'll typically use the convention of calling the first variable x1, the second variable x2, the next one x3, and so on. The first time we learn about finding solutions for linear systems in algebra, we might have done so through the process of graphing. This idea that each equation was represented by a flat graph in the two-dimensional x and y case. This graph is a line. And if the graphs don't intersect, like in this case of parallel lines, then our system has no solution. If our graphs do a typical thing and cross at one specific point, then that's when we have one unique solution, and the coordinates of that intersection point are the solution itself. It's also possible that we discover our graphs lie on top of each other somehow in more than one place, and that gives us a case where we have infinitely many solutions, and as we've drawn here, that would be all the points on this line since they are all intersection points. You may or may not have also already come across a way that we sort of lump these things together. For the cases on the right, these are different than the one on the left. For these, we have at least some kind of answer. Could be a single answer, could be many answers, but we've got them. And we refer to these types of linear systems as consistent. In the case where there are no solutions for our system, meaning that somehow all the information we have doesn't work together to create something that can be true for all of our equations, we call this inconsistent. And so one of the major questions that continues to appear throughout linear algebra is, does a solution exist, meaning is the system consistent or not? And if we do have a solution, is that solution a unique one? One of the most common ways that we'll see linear systems represented in linear algebra is not in their equation form, but rather in their matrix form. Remember that a matrix is just a rectangular table, sometimes called an array, that contains all the information about each variable in a particular column of that table. If we want to talk about what size of matrix we're working with, we'll give that in a statement that tells us first the number of rows in our matrix, followed by the number of columns in our matrix. So for this first matrix on the left here with only ones and zeros for all of its entries, since it has three rows and three columns, we call this a three by three matrix. Our next one here, we have one, two rows and one, two, three columns. So this is a two by three matrix. Remember that rows in a theater run side to side, and columns on the front of a building run up and down, so that's a way you can keep those two solid in your mind. Our last monster here, we have four rows. We have five columns, so this one is a four by five matrix. When we're wanting to represent information about our linear system in matrix form, there are a couple of ways we'll look at things. If we're mostly interested in the coefficients of what we typically think of as the left side of the system as it's written here, then we may simply look at the coefficients written as a matrix. You'll notice that all the x1 coefficients are organized in the same column, all of the x2 coefficients as well. You'll also notice here that when one of the variables is not written in the equation, that of course means that the coefficient in that equation is actually zero, so we write that in our matrix as well. 
you can also see that information from each equation becomes its own row in our matrix. Often we'll also want to include information about the constants on the right side of each equation, so that will give us an additional column for our matrix, and we call that matrix that includes this information the augmented matrix for the linear system. So far in your math career, you might have used a mixture of three main methods for solving linear systems. When doing these in an introductory algebra setting, the first one we've already mentioned here briefly is graphing. Again, in two-dimensional space, if we have two variables, the idea being if we graph one linear equation, then the other, we find the intersection point, if there is one, then the intersection gives us the values for x1 and x2. If we have three variables, then to graph the system, each variable needs its own axis. And so now our flat graph in three-dimensional space is a plane. Assuming that we have three equations to go with our three variables, we can graph the second equation and then the third. And if those planes all intersect at a particular point, then we get our solution for x1, x2, and x3 as a point in 3D space. Graphing gives us a clear idea of how to picture solutions, but only up to a point. Even this graph on the right here is really not a 3D graph, right? It's just a flat on your screen that you're watching right now, 2D approximation of some 3D drawing. And you can think about then if we add a fourth variable to our system or even more, attempting to graph systems in four dimensional space or 11 dimensional space or whatever, okay, that's really difficult. So we need some other ways to solve our systems. The next big idea in solving that you encountered was probably substitution. This was the idea that we can use one of the equations solved for one of the variables to produce a substitution for that variable. We then take that information and substitute it into another equation in the system, and that allows us to end up with an equation that contains less variables and is hopefully easier to solve. Once we solve the remaining variable, we typically then use that answer and substitute the value back into equations in the system to get the rest of the solution. Substitution is especially useful when we have a partial solution for the system and we simply want to back substitute to get the rest of the solution. We'll sometimes use this back substitution process in linear algebra as well, but it can be inefficient when solving a large system from the beginning. That leads us to our last method we are probably familiar with, which is elimination. Elimination will be our most used method in linear algebra, though we'll do it a bit differently than they do it in beginning algebra. The idea with elimination is that we know in math we are allowed to multiply both sides of an equation by a real number, and that, combined with the idea of adding equations together, helps us to eliminate variables and then solve. In beginning algebra, we might have looked at this system here, perhaps at the x2 terms, and noticed that the coefficients have a common multiple of 12. So if we could try to produce a positive 12x2 term in one equation and a negative 12x2 term in the other equation, then when we add those equations together, we'll no longer have x2 to deal with, and it makes it much easier for us to solve the other variable x1. In linear algebra, what we'll usually do is think of our system in its matrix form and use similar elimination procedures, keeping a few particular rules in mind, to help us solve the system. Our next videos in our linear algebra series are about the ways we both think about and go about using elimination to solve, in particular getting more familiar with matrices and how to work with them in the solution process. Next up, we'll be sharing about echelon forms for matrices and how to find a pivot position in a matrix. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.